you uh, at this uh, parallel session one uh, of this third day of the final summit RRI for Rio. And as you know, this third day is devoted uh, mainly on the future bodies and the future destiny of uh, RRI. So uh, we are speaking uh, uh, mainly of what will happen to RRI and open science, uh, both in uh, political terms, but also in substantive terms, uh, especially in the perspective of the shift from Horizon 2020 and the Horizon U uh, framework programs. Uh, this parallel section, this uh, section turns around the contribution of Robert Brown that I thank you very much for uh, being here, also on behalf of uh, the other participants. Uh, Robert is a research institute of the advanced studies in Vienna. Uh, he's uh, uh, researchers uh, uh, with a background in philosophy and uh, uh, science technology studies, and uh, is presently involved uh, in the New Horizon project, which is exactly right, precisely focused on how to to promote the embedment of RRI in research and innovation system that is not only uh, in research institutions but also in uh, uh, in, uh, in enterprises and the industry. Uh, Robert's presentation will deal with uh, uh, RRI as a cross-cutting issue and so I thank him again and uh, I give you Robert the floor. Uh, I suppose that you have the slides to share. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luciano. Um, yes, this is mainly about New Horizon. Um, I also greet everyone, especially my colleagues uh, from the uh, New Horizon uh, projects, Stephanie and Ingeborg, who will also present uh, during the session. So you'll see three presentations. Um, I'll start and then Stephanie will follow and then Ingeborg uh, presenting some of the findings, um, very interesting, um, will be last but not least. Um, and uh, I suggest that we do uh, 15 minutes presentation and then five minutes uh, Q&A and then at the end we can hopefully have a, a meaningful discussion uh, about the future of RRI as Luciano has suggested. So I will now uh, share my screen. Um, I hope that uh, you will see. Um, and um, I'll talk about the drama of RRI, ups and downs of a funding policy. Um, this is a snapshot of our results on, at New, in New Horizon. Um, this is the content. Um, basically, our question is, why did RRI not emerge and constitute and continue as a strong funding instrument. And we'll use Sabatier's advocacy coalition approach and we'll contrast um, our right to another um, concept in, in research and innovation, excellence, that does have a strong policy uh, institutionalization, which is the ERC, as you all know. Um, we're on the macro level. Um, the project obviously is much more than this. So we have uh, meso and micro uh, level uh, findings as well. But I, in this presentation, will stay on the macro level. I'll focus on the conceptual challenges and policy paradigm options. And uh, our method in this project uh, was a diagnosis and action research in social apps that we have done. Some of you may be aware of what we did. This is an overall research of age 2020. Here are the 18 program lines. We established social apps and these social apps followed up um, and then investigated the possibility of mainstreaming RI in Horizon Europe, as Luciano said. One of the publications that already emerged uh, from our project is a science uh, uh, publication, science magazine publication. And there, our main argument was that responsibility 
or RRI in the EC policy discourse is more a normative political wish or position as opposed to a properly implemented policy in the European Commission. It's, it's a pretty strong statement and we argue, I think, extensively, um, why is it so? Um, as Luciano alluded to, RRI has been demoted to a cross-cutting issue in Horizon Europe. I won't go into the definitional landscape, you all know, but this is clearly uh, the motion from having an institutional home in SWAFs as a separate program line and also institutional grounding in the bureaucracy. So our main question was why did RI not emerge and continue as influential funding instrument and implemented policy on proposal and evaluation levels despite of the two decades of addressing science society interrelations with EC funding. Um, and we will, or I will look through four areas that we find interesting and um, where we're looking for the reason why this is the landscape. We argue that there is a semantic fragility of RI's policy objective we also argue that there is a financial fragility as funding instrument. There is a legal, legal fragility of RI as funding line. And there is an institutional or bureaucratic fragility of the SWAFS unit as a policy operationalization instrument. So here is an overview of, um, of the story, as you all know. Um, it all started in the seventh framework program, science in society, 2007, and then continued in 2014 as um, um, inscribed in the Rome Declaration, the six keys. And then in 2016, under um, Commissioner Moedas, uh, the three O strategy, open innovation, open science, and open to the world emerged. Um, what we call this history, when you're looking at it, is, and this is uh, why these terms were relevant, it was starting from public engagement, science communication, gender, to research ethics, science education, open access, and then the three O's, that there is a definitional debate, what RRI is. There is also a conflict, as we all know, between the academics and the um, the policy people. So there is a definitional problem with RRI. Um, when we look at the uh, funding instrument, we see a certain level of growth until age 2020. It started in FP6 with 88 million, over to FP7 with 280 million. And the last time around in Horizon 2020, it was almost 500 million. However, in Horizon Europe, while there is 400 million euros for what's called reforming and enhancing the European research and innovation system, this is allocated across 14 action lines, none of which specifically target RRI as an overarching policy instrument. So advocates of RRI uh, argue that actually with SWAFs, as an independent program line, RRI disappeared as a funding instrument. Um, there are no funding uh, swaps like uh, activities in widening and enhancing the uh, European research arena. And RRI is only marginally mentioned in, the, uh, in Horizon Europe uh, legal texts. Um, this means that there is a legal framing problem. RRI as an overarching policy instrument did not make it into the legally binding documents that form the legal basis of Horizon Europe. So there is a legal framing problem. And then, as I have already alluded to, there is a bureaucracy issue. Bureaucracy is obviously here used in the, um, uh, as a term to operationalize um, policy and while in 2014 a separate SWAFs unit was established, 
uh, with two subunits, gender and RRI, and ethics and open access have been addressed in separate unit. The, uh, there happened throughout the years a continuous reduction of the staff until uh, in 2019, unfortunately, the SWOFs unit was dissolved and an open science, um, which is of a different um, policy kind, was um, established. Um, so there is a bureaucracy issue as well. Um, and all of these come together asking the question, why wasn't there a strong advocacy coalition that actually made RRI happen in the European uh, research and innovation landscape. Um, advocacy coalition as an idea, as a theory, um, originates, as you all know, from Sabatier. And it means that there are a variety of positions held by people, elected and agency officials, who share a particular belief system and who show a non-trivial degree of coordinated action over time. So uh, positions, belief system, and coordinated activity over time are key, key issues. Um, someone not familiar with the concept might, might ask, why are beliefs important? Beliefs, on the one hand, are important because that's how um, ideals translate into policy action. There are core beliefs, there, are, there is uh, something that leads to a policy core, and then there are secondary aspects of this belief that take um, action, policy action, to the implementation of policy that we see lacking. And our argument is that the three problems, the definition debate, the legal framing debate, and the bureaucracy debate, all prohibited such a unified actor coalition to emerge. Actually, there were three coalitions um, that, that were struggling around the concept of RRI. As you see, one of the um, actor coalitions or advocacy coalitions was a pro RRI coalition, actually already made up of two kinds, the pragmatists and the idealists. There was another who said that Actually, there is de facto RI, so there is no strong need for a dedicated policy. And obviously, there were the RI critics and all the actors who were unaware of RI. So there was a, a pro RI group. The core value or belief was we need RI to make our uh, research and innovation better. Um, there was the de facto group who already who said that our RRI is already done, no additional policy is needed. And then there were the, the excellent science people um, who, who, who thought that science should be excellent and excellent only. And the technology push and uh, the research ethics people who said that while technology push um, complemented with ethical awareness is good enough um, in, on the research and innovation landscape, there is no need to, to have RI included as policy. And as you see, from a resources perspective, the two groups who were pro RI were the weakest. Um, the de facto group was pretty strong, but the strongest obviously were the RI critics and the actors who were unaware that RI even exists. Um, then comes the problems and the problems, as I alluded to, were of fragility. And the reason why we believe that such fragility emerged was A, our um, lack of ability to explain the benefit, but most importantly, the rationale of our right. We didn't have unified and strong group of policy brokers who could promote the embedding of RRI in EC funding, and um, we had a very limited access to policy forums, uh, although we did try, but we did have an extremely limited access. We also were facing strong opposition from critics of RRI, and there were competing challenges from arriving from established concepts like research ethics or the gender uh, group, etc. 
So um, we want to compare because you would think that this is the normal way of affairs and such fragilities should be overcome easily and then uh, a policy instrument will prevail. But we have a good example and this is the ARC where there was semantic stability, financial stability, legal stability and institutional stability. Um, the establishment of the ERC, Excellent Science, was an outcome of a successful political campaign and an orchestrated political endeavor in which there was one unified and strong advocacy coalition built up of scientific and scholarly communities, European industries, politicians, members of state at council level, also convincing the European Parliament and European Commission members. Here are some quotes how this coalition was established from Helga Novotny, the former uh, Austrian ERC president. As you see, strategy number one, which was key, no definitional problems, no definitional um, ambiguities. The message has to be conveyed loudly and clearly. We need to influence the debate, speak with one voice, speak at the right time, speak at the right place, and above all, repeat, repeat, repeat the message. Um, so, not only was it um, financially stable, but it, was it became institutionally stable because there was a framework, a funding framework, but also it alluded to a self-governance and autonomy by scientists for scientists. Um, this is also something that we couldn't establish. So, the answer to the question, we believe, is that our advocates could not build an advocacy coalition with a unified message, a strong institutional embeddedness within the EC, and find supporters within and in the orbit of R&I ecosystems. So, what follows from this? Um, our conclusion is, from the New Horizon project, that to overcome uh, these troubles, RI advocates should develop a strong and unified policy message instead of focusing on definitions, find key policy brokers in and outside of the EC and effectively connect RI to the current changes that are happening, um, sustainability, responsibility, mistrust in science, climate change, etc. And RI then and then only can transform into an integral element of European research funding. Obviously, this is not only my work. Um, Eric, who is the coordinator of New Horizon, and other colleagues have been instrumental to putting all this together. It's also becoming a paper that is um, in the making and soon to be published. Um, thank you very much. This was a quick overview. Uh, and obviously, I'm very happy to answer questions. And then when all the three presentations are done, we can come back to a dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I believe that's a very interesting policy analysis of the situation of RRI. And I believe that it's very useful. Uh, be aware, being aware of the fragility of RRI, absolutely. So it's a good starting point, uh, I believe. So, um, uh, I don't know that there are questions. Uh, uh, you can use both uh, uh, the, the chat uh, system and uh, you can raise your hand for posing questions. Otherwise, we can continue. The, but uh, uh, I would like to know if there are, there are uh, questions or Okay. Everything was very clear, apparently. No, 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 it's, uh, uh, it, it's uh, interesting understanding. Uh, uh, yes, okay, Giovanni, you are the floor, thanks. Uh, you, you are unmoved, perhaps uh, we don't hear you. Okay. Now yes, now is good. <laughs> okay. So, 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was just curious to ask you, uh, since in the in the previous session it has been uh, stressed that uh, in uh, Horizon Europe RRI is not there independently, but uh, it has sort of uh, been uh, uh, incorporated in in many other ways without being uh, mentioned explicitly. But that that could even be a sign that uh, it is consolidated in a way. Uh, so, what do you make of that claim? Do you think it is just uh, over-optimistic and uh, the reality is uh, the bleak one that you have presented? Um, I think this is, this is the optimistic version. Um, and uh, uh, unsurprisingly, I'll disagree and I'll disagree uh, on two counts. One, there is this proverbial saying that, um, don't, you, don't show me your words, show me your budget. <laughs> and uh, I think I think uh, this is um, why we use the ERC as an example. That um, um, on the one hand, uh, RI requires further research uh, of how to do it, how to embed it, to disseminate it. So both RIAs and CSAs um, that emerge from SWAFs are further required. Otherwise, they'll stay in a silo. Um, on the other hand, um, and that's why we're talking about policy implementation, that um, to avoid RI becoming a rhetorical exercise or a tick box exercise, you need appropriate um, policy instruments. And this is, you know, this is not rocket science. Policy instruments are available. Um, you can include RI in the evaluation criteria. You can include RI in proposal templates. You can include RI in a number of policy ways, as excellent science is. And we're not arguing against excellent science. What we are arguing, obviously, is that RI is part of excellent science. Excellent science, on the one hand, has an independent funding vehicle, DRC. We would require a similar one, and also beyond the ERC, it is included as policy instrument in a number of ways. Their understanding of what excellent science means. And this is what we are arguing for. RI will be implemented in research in innovation if it is implemented through policies. And as said, there are a number of policies available, none of which are used in the templates, none of which are used as criteria for or means to evaluate uh, proposals. So this is um, the non, not so optimistic version. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there are a comment that is uh, follow the money is a way for assessing the relevance of a policy. That is, that is uh, uh, chez l'argent. <laughs> for understanding couldn't, something. Couldn't agree, uh, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Yeah, and uh, I can also uh, suggest that something similar happened with the gender issues in the past, with the idea of mainstreaming gender. And uh, often this mainstreaming gender has been interpreted as a diluting gender issues. That is, uh, the risk uh, to to dilute gender issue in diversity policies, uh, diluting uh, 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 gender issues in many, many different uh, streams of budget too. So at the end, uh, the gender issues disappeared. So sometimes it happens that for promoting something more, you will arrive to have much, more, much less uh, in your in your hands. So I don't know that there are other issues and questions from participants. Otherwise, uh, I could suggest to 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 go on. I don't know. I I will leave the the floor to uh, Stephanie. Or it's good. Okay. So thanks, Stephanie Daimer, to be here, and uh, I give her the, the floor for the second presentation. Thanks. Okay. Hello, hi. Um, I guess you can hear me, and um, yes. I realize I cannot start my video, but maybe it's it's important that you can hear me. So, um, hi, yes. Um, so I think that connects actually very well what I'm going to present um, to Robert's presentation as um, 
he has taken us a bit from the past to the present, let's say. So we're taking you a bit from the present to the future. And I guess also a bit back to the present. And, um, and I also um, realized that then Ingeborg, I guess, will really talk about the present uh, and, the, and the particular great tool that we have developed in New Horizons. So um, I think you can also see my slides now. And um, you can see this is um, work um, I'm presenting today together with my colleague Merve Jorunas again. Um, a first snapshot on ongoing work um, in New Horizon that we are doing. There is a couple of more people involved in that. You'll see that on the last slide. Merve and I are based in Karlsruhe in Germany at the Fraunhofer Institute for, Pro for Systems and Innovation Research. Um, the two of us are respond let me see that this works um here we go all right so the two of us are responsible for the social lab that deals with science with and for society um in horizon 2020 which you certainly know very well obviously so i don't have to say anything about the program line of course so um and robert already has explained a bit the action research approach that new horizon takes um so it won't also go more into detail of that. So uh, with this presentation, what we'd like to do is um, we invite you to a discussion about the future of RI, or let's say we present a tool that might help to um, invite others to discuss about the future of RI. So our social lab participants found it very important actually to prepare actions that feed the debate around the need for policies like RI and how RI should be or could be developed further. So there was this assumption that um, RRI is also tied to the time when it was invented. And perhaps this is now the time also to go on and think, think ahead on how RI might develop further. So we wanted to do scenarios for the future of RI. Um, as, a, as we think this, these are, this is a great tool actually to, um, discuss uh, uh, in a more structured way about potential future options and developments. Actually, it's not at all possible um, to do um, scenarios about the future of RI because as you can see here, RI has been designed as a specific policy intervention reacting to policy problems with science society interactions at the time when it was designed. So. As such, RI is also dependent on the framework conditions that shape science society interactions. Um, just uh, we have listed a few examples here. So the political system and other political variables obviously are important here. Societal development. So um, if we want to explore the RI actually uh, to shape the um, from yeah factor to another in order to arrive at an influence matrix. You can see that here on the slide. This matrix helped us, helped us to understand um, which of our factors are the least dependent from the others as such a quite <laughs> independent factor um, is an ideal starting point 
of scenario pathways. That is the logic, how we created the scenario pathways. So rather independent factors provide sort of um, switches um, where scenarios take fundamentally different pathways. You can see that a bit in the um, upper uh, right corner of the slide. Um, where you take one factor as a beginning or starting factor, and then this um, sort of helps you then um, um, compose your different scenario pathways. Um, and factors shaping Um, it was quite strong um, um, outside borders um, um, and we have a number three scenario called um, failed democracy. This is a populist with a tendency to an autocratic system scenario and finally we have a technocratic um, and centralized strong state scenario which is called the benevolent green bureaucrats. So um, you can see these scenarios consider really drastic changes of politics and even political systems. Um, and these go hand in hand, of course, with societal developments. So um, what does this mean for future science society interactions um, in those cases? Again, we, we find that this is quite drastic if we, if we stay within the logic of our scenarios. So. Um, only in one case, the case of the Fortress Europe here, um, we have a, a market-based, free market and open kind of um, basic mechanism um, acting um, in society. So this is rather, we would consider a rather incremental development from today, whereas the other three developments that I'm going to show you are really sort of more transformative. So in the kingdom scenario, we move to a um, more discursive society. In the failed democracy, we move even to a scenario where we have a suppressed society or where there is tokenistic um, societal um, involvement. And the benevolent green bureaucrats in a very extreme way might appear or, um, yeah, um, develop into a collectivist society where we have really steered um, ways of science society interactions. And you see that um, these scenarios are not really meant to be desirable. So um, as I said, they shall be plausible. And as such, they all provide sort of small promising answers, sometimes a bit bigger promising answers perhaps to our current crisis as well. Um, as critical development. So all scenarios have, let's say, good and bad sides. Um, and let's have a quick look maybe at the rather more positive sides that one could try to find in each of these scenarios. Um, if, you, if you look at the Kingdom of um, RRI scenario, there's a high quality of life. If you look at um, the Fortress Europe, you really see that Europe is prosperous here in green technologies. That is the logic here. In failed democracy, um, in a populist world, you could at least say that this is a world where we have social cohesion, at least at the surface, and this is sort of the main rationale for a, for a populist regime. Um, and in the um, benevolent green bureaucrat scenario, this is an approach where we really see sort of a rational and evidence-informed sustainability transition taking place. We do unfortunately not have the time to really go deeper into the scenarios. We, we rather would like to show you a bit how we have started to work with these scenarios. 
um, in order to draw implications from them. Um, for example, the scenarios alert us that we cannot hope to really get rid of our current policy problems. And here's one example. So technolo technological solutions might not be enough to fix challenges like climate, like the climate, the climate crisis. We see that today and we will see that in the future, it might develop in the future again. For example, and this is uh, very clear in the failed democracy scenario here, um, this problem clearly persists because there's some so, just some sort of ad hoc fixing of really critical developments, but not really a, sort of a, a more anticipatory approach to how, how to um, yeah how to mitigate climate crisis and other challenges. And we have additional problems that might become urgent or that will become urgent in the future. Here's another example. We have three future scenarios that bear the risk to limit the freedom of science to an extent which is critical. And this is interesting because Robert really has spoken um, sort of um, about the, 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 other, the opposite problem that we have today where the excellence paradigm is really strong and the advocacy for the freedom of science is a really, really strong advocacy. And then we see somehow this might flip around in the future um, to an extent which is also perhaps critical because um, the kingdom of RI scenario might be a scenario where we have sort of excessive societal ex agenda setting, um, which is just um, overstated. Um, we have in the benevolent green bureaucrat scenario, really technocratic steering taking place, which really might limit the freedom of researchers. And we have in the failed democracy, the case of political control and even suppression of critical researchers. And there's another example for you. Um, we, we see basically in each of the scenarios that there might be problems of inclusion. Um, and if we stay within the logic of the different scenarios, the problem of inclusion might become, a, let's say, a, a, a relevant policy problem in at least two of the scenarios. Um, if you look in the Kingdom of RRI scenario, there you can find that this kind of really broad participatory approach really is not um, implemented in a good way because finally it ends up in um, elite participation um, that really sort of a, creates a bubble kind of thing and is not really um, representative for the whole society. And if you look at the Fortress Europe example, in this kind of um, market-based logic, um, where we have almost no state intervention. Um, we, we find eco-innovations, which is interesting, but they are only affordable to the rich. So this really creates some sort of two-class society, social disparity both in the EU, but also um, um, in, the, in the relationship between the EU and the rest of the world. So this creates also um, more global poverty migra migration um, because Europe really becomes a prosperous place to live. So the question is um, also, what does this mean for the, for the policies? Will we see policy interventions similar to today's RRI appearing in the future? And I guess you have a hunch right now after having heard this, and this hunch is maybe, well, maybe rather not. And um, I guess this is what, what we see as well. Um, um, first, um, if you look um, into the future as described in the Fortress Europe scenario, here, state interventions are highly unlikely. So um, what we might see, of course, is um, um, voluntary engagement and a lot of um, different um, yeah, self, um, um, how do we say that? <laughs> uh, so you see a lot of um, volunteer um, engagement, a lot of, a lot of um, individual and private initiatives um, that address different kind of issues. Um, and that also might be very interesting in terms of sort of open innovation processes and this kind of stuff, but it is nothing sort of, no, no policy, no state policy taking place here. Um, and the other example is, um, or that we look now is the failed democracy type. Um, here, an RRI type intervention in the logic that we discuss about it today, inclusive and democratic and so on, can not at all be expected in such a scenario. So 
if we see citizen engagement here that is tokenistic and just to make sure to provide lip service to the populist leader. But let us look a bit further into the other two scenarios, how RRI or any successor might look like. And you, if you look at the benevolent green Eurocrats first, um, this scenario considers a societal transformation where ultimately collective goals are prioritized. And this is really, I mean, they are pr prioritized over individual rights and interests. So um, the successor of RRI in this scenario really will have to focus on gathering societal support for the central grand sustainability narrative. So that means that political communication, science communication will have to be really, really different from today and will have to be really important in such a scenario. And looking at the last scenario, we have seen that the Kingdom of RRI scenario basically um, bears in its scenario logic that a lot of the RRI principles and instruments that we have today in place or that we would like to see to be in place, um, that is, they, so this is in the logic already of the scenario, but it leads to problems as I have shown you. So this extensive intermingling of science and society might really become problematic um, if it's presented as a one size fits all approach, um, which is which is the logic of the Kingdom of RRI scenario. So um, societal um, actors um, yeah, might, have, might be critical towards open uh, or high risk research, and this is why they might a bit suppress it. Um, so already for today, we see that RRI perhaps has the best chance to survive if it's really conceptualized in a more tailored way, um, really tied to specific kind of policy problems that you want to address and not just um, yeah, um, as a top-down sort of approach that, um, that is used for all instances in all cases. And let me say briefly, um, a last example um, we see, uh, um, which we think is really, really interesting. We see that science education becomes in the kingdom scenario very important because you need to empower citizens to take part in RRI in order to also to address this inclusion problem. And um, we also see that education um, in general, but also science education are very, very important in the failed democracy and in the benevolent green Eurocrat scenario, because both require ideological reforms of the education systems um, in order to ensure the social cohesion. So, um, you see these scenarios are not at all meant to be desirable. They shall be plausible. I've, uh, no, uh, no, I have said this already. So you might feel really that this is some, in, in, a, in a way this is really radical, but also my, some people might say, well, this is a bit overstated, but actually this is fine because this helps us to start a discussion about this. And what we find important is that the scenarios play with the current observations that political debates have become more ideological extreme in the past years, where we see that fundamental democratic principles and institutions are called into questions, into question. So we really see that the debate about RRI cannot just leave this out. We really have to consider that there is broad changes um, ahead of us and that this is um, really important when we talk about science society interactions and the kind of policy intervention then that is needed to address problems with science society interactions. So this has been a really, really quick ride through the current status of our work. We are preparing a website with texts and graphics um, about the scenarios. We are writing a paper, it's in preparation. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions now and please just also get in touch afterwards if you feel there's anything to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you really for the contributions. Very interesting your reasoning about the future scenario of uh, science society uh, relationships. So we will have uh, we'll have some uh, uh, critical boundaries for understanding and distinction for understanding possible futures. So thank you really. Um, we have not so much time, unfortunately, because we have the next uh, the next session starting at uh, eleven forty five. So I don't know that there is a uh, uh, answer there is question or uh, issue to be raised uh, by the participants. 
I, I, uh, I'm very happy if someone should ask something. Otherwise, I, if I understand correctly, there is another contribution, taking into account that we have some 10 minutes uh, for, for the contribution, because so we have some very short moment for uh, a discussion. I don't see any anyone raising the hand or chatting something. Okay, so I, I I'm very happy to I'm very glad to, to to give the floor to Ingeborg Mayer. Hi, hello. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you to be here also for you. Yeah. Um I will start sharing my, uh, my screen. I cannot start my video, so you will have to do it without. Yeah, don't worry. Okay. Take, take into account the, 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 the minutes. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, we, we are seeing it. Oh, okay. That, that is in the in the mode. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will put okay. it in right mode now. Yes. Okay. Yes. The third contribution from the New Horizon project is about the societal readiness thinking tool, which is more or less ready to go. As as I will show you, uh, in I hope a not too long uh, presentation. Um, it's the work of a lot of people working in New Horizon, um, and I won't mention them all. Um, but it started uh, as a kind of a site pass um, because it was specifically asked for in the call to develop a societal readiness level um, uh, that could complement the TRL that is uh, as uh, probably well known to, to everyone. Uh, and as you can see uh, from the title, the level has disappeared and I will explain you why. And I will also show what has come in the place for that level. Um, actually, we, uh, after, after extensive discussions, we thought that the societal readiness level, as we then talked about it, should be, some, should be, should be helping to put RI into practice and that it would be uh, uh, on, on how scientists and engineers could mature the societal readiness of their research projects. So uh, in order to arrive at that, we did a very uh, extensive literature review. Um, we came up with a, a set of questions instead of uh, tick boxing things, designed a, a, a the preliminary tool um, uh, in a design sprint uh, exercise two day long and then we started to test the tool which we have done in the last year um, and that uh, and that will be well that I will show you in in, in a snapshot uh, the, the results of these steps so um, this was the literature review, and we came up with the with the conceptual concepts of of the of the RRI um, literature, both the EC strand and uh, and the and the and the, the academic uh, concepts popped out as the most uh, relevant ones, and that is where we build upon. So this is the TRL, and and I'm, I'm and, and this level thing is not something that we want to work. So how then can we translate the the more operational and and theoretical concepts and and make it uh, make it useful for 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 research and innovation practices? So this is about from technology push to science pool and to think about uh, desirable futures and most most uh, notably to um, to think about the social appropriateness of the work that you are doing uh, and anticipate on that so the question is is that scalable and we decided that it was not because you can't compare uh, reflexivity or gender or openness or transparency or uh, ethics on these skills and then put a, put a number to that so to put that very shortly 
uh, that was the outcome of a long, long debate uh, within the consortium and within the working group. So um, it is more about the, the, the willingness uh, and the ability to consider all these societal implications. And the idea was to help them uh, with that through uh, providing questions for on a, on a, um, a lot of different uh, relevant topics related to RRI. Um, and to that we used the, 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 the keys and the conditions. So the anticipate, reflect, include and respond for the RE framework and, uh, and, the, uh, and the keys as uh, the operational keys by, defined by the commission. And um, in the tool we also thought of um, the different phases and gates that research and uh, innovation go through. So it goes from research design and problem formulation up until launching and dissemination. And of course, this is not linear, but as you will see in the tool, it will is, is, um, is of course, uh, a circular and, 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 and feedback. There are many feedback loops. So this is, the idea is that the more influence, uh, uh, RRI influence you have in the beginning of a project, the more societal ready you will be uh, when you enter the, the final stages. Um, so uh, just to give you an example, uh, what do we have when we uh, are thinking about these things is uh, at, at the first gate, so at the first uh, project uh, stage, a question could be, what are the potential barriers to making your data coding and publications open access? So that is something, uh, a question to reflect upon. And another example could be, how will you address barriers to gender balance in research and leadership? So all these questions um, were then entered into a tool uh, after long discussions on the design. So. Um, this, these were the, 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 the design criteria uh, that we used uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the for the tool and I think the most important one is the entry point that we use because when a user enters this tool it is not because they are interested in RI it is because they want to uh, to either write a proposal or think about something else so there's an a, a, a clear reason to enter and we try to define these reasons and define them as entry points. So this is I think the most important thing before I will shortly show you what it looks like. This is when you enter the thinkingtool.eu tool um, and it is has a has a has a an, um, an introduction uh, that is uh, Hi, Starting here. And welcome to the Societal Readiness Thinking Tool. The main purpose of this tool is to help researchers think carefully about societal responsibilities in their own projects. In this video, we will show you how to use the SR Thinking Tool. You can enter the tool with or without registration. If you choose to register, you'll be able to retain your activities in the tool's database and continue your work at a later point in time. When entering the tool, you'll be asked to select the current research phase of your project. The thinking tool differentiates four phases common to most research projects. Phase one, research design and problem formulation. Phase two, implementation, data collection and testing. Phase three, data analysis and evaluation. Phase four, launching and dissemination. After choosing an appropriate project phase, you'll be asked to select a relevant entry point or to choose the responsible research and innovation keys or conditions that you want to focus on in your work. The purpose of the entry point function is to tailor a list of questions that suit your motivations for using the tool. For instance, you can choose to reflect on how to address societal challenges and trends in your work. If you wish to restrict your focus to specific responsible research and innovation keys or conditions, you can tick off relevant focus areas in the selection pane. 
You can learn more about responsible research and innovation by using the tooltips. They become visible when you hover the cursor over specific keys and conditions. In the circle located in the center of the screen, you'll be asked to respond to a list of questions that are tailored to your selection. You can respond to the questions by writing text in the field at the center of the circle. To help you in answering each question, a pop-up window with information about relevant methods and resources can be accessed through a link right below this text box. The methods section is merely meant to serve as an inspiration when using the tool. The box on the right side of the screen helps you to keep track of the questions you have already answered. If you wish to continue onto another project phase, this function is available at the upper left side of the screen. By hovering the cursor over a particular gate, you can get information about what characterizes this phase of the research process. At the bottom right side of the screen, you can generate a PDF. If you find a question to be lacking, it is also possible to add your own questions. The PDF lists the tailor-made questions and publishes the answers you have made. Thanks for listening. We hope that our thinking tool helps you to cultivate a forward-looking approach to responsibility in the research and innovation process of your project. So that is what the tool looks like and it was launched actually last November in 2019. And in that time it was, um, it was uh, discussed within uh, several uh, social labs. Uh, to collect the relevant feedback. And I think one of the things that came out there is that, that a lot of people still want to have some sort of measurement. So this, this level discussion keeps up, keep, keeps on popping up. But we, what we then did was starting uh, a real um, uh, 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 research project with uh, researchers and with research staff and using the tool as a, uh, as a, a to, and to, to let them work through the tool. Uh, researchers did thinking out loud sessions uh, and the other ones uh, with the research staff were with focus groups. And in that way, we collected a lot of uh, feedback and perceptions on the, about the tool. Uh, on the right bottom side, you see the funding agency. So that is the fourth place where we would like to, 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 to start the discussion. And actually yesterday I was approached by the Medical Research Council, Sonnenwe, of the Netherlands to, to, to uh, think about this, uh, th this tool because they were thinking about a uh, societal readiness level thing. And I said to them, well, that's where we start three years ago. So please welcome, be welcome and, and, and um, jump on this bandwagon. Um, just uh, feedback from stakeholders, which was a system based on a systematic analysis of responses and due to the time I won't go through all of this, but this is more or less uh, in terms of expectations and also aspects that were discussed, uh, what we got out of it. Uh, which means that there are uh, uh, things to, uh, can be adjusted. And from all this uh, feedback analysis, we have three <clears throat> important policy recommendations. One for researchers to advise them on the urgency of the practical integration of RRI in research. Uh, and, and we think that, that this should be more than just mentioning it in goals, calls and giving examples, but to, to let them uh, go uh, through uh, the societal readiness thinking tool um, and, and refer them to that as well and make it, uh, make it uh, something that, that, uh, that is uh, added in the annex and can be used. There are a lot of research staff feedback that said if we can use the PDF text directly into proposals or into evaluations, that would be great. Um, there were other up, uh, comments like it would be great if we could sit together on and work in a group on this tool. Um, there were uh, mentions of whether this could be very useful for self-assessment to think about 
to, to, to assess whether we have done and thought of all the things that are relevant. Um, so the uh, so one the last uh, advice is to policymakers and to take part in the co-creation of the further development of the thinking tool. Um, then uh, the last uh, issues and, and, and next steps is uh, so adjust the design for other use. We have brought the societal readiness thinking tool also into the Super Mori project, and we are discussing it um, as, a, as a starting point for a monitoring and evaluation uh, system in the territorial RRI um, uh, projects. We are thinking about uh, awareness and uptake and actually the policy brief that describes the tool will be launched very shortly. Um, and we'll, I hope that we can use that to encourage the use in the context of Horizon Europe. And then of course, uh, the critical issue is the sustainability of the tool and the, the, the design thing and where it's located and to maintain that beyond the New Horizon project. So with that, I would like to stop uh, and open the discussion if there's still some time left. I hope that I kept the time. Thank you very much for your contribution. And we have a, a very comprehensive view of the large kind of activities carried out under this project and also these uh, tools that could be really useful. I, I, unfortunately, we have four minutes before, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, before uh, stop, uh, the stop because we have then uh, moving to the other room for the plenary. But if you have very short issues, so very short questions to be replied in uh, some seconds, we have uh, uh, Claudio Colonello on the societal readiness tool is interesting, the question about the need of inclusion of intersectionality aspect uh, in the reflection question besides gender yeah and uh, also uh, uh, it's possible the development for territorial RRI that is another issue yeah. often touched by by the commission other very short comment or question the intersectionality questions are included in the questions actually it's under the umbrella of gender but of course it is is inside uh, the inclusiveness yeah. and diversity much much broader i don't want to discourage uh people to to say something but if you if you can in very few seconds we still have three minutes uh, Luciano, if i yes. can say something yeah sure uh, coming back to the what robert brown said i'm, I'm very um Agree with, I agree with uh, his analysis, very, very impressive, very interesting. Uh, just a few words for the RRI coalition, let's say, <laughs> uh, the, for the advocacy uh, about RRI. The first one, it's important uh, adequate investment in order to bring RRI in the, in the new program, of course. It's important to have adequate investment, as Robert said. It's important to connect RRI with policies. In my opinion, it's also important to bring RRI as much as possible outside the RRI community. And uh, the final um, thing I think is uh, uh, very important also uh, to have uh, uh, on the side of European Commission people, I mean officers, able to handle the, let's say, RRI contents. Because uh, if we want to mainstream concretely and effectively RRI across uh, the new program, and this uh, uh, capacity of uh, European Commission to handle the contents of RRI is not uh, is something that cannot be taken for granted. Thank okay. you. I don't know that you want to reply something, and then we have to close. Robert. Yeah, very very shortly. I agree. Um, three things. Um, uh, to, to, to build a successful advocacy coalition, you need uh, resources, which politicians have. You need policy instruments, with which policy people have. And you need supporters in legitimation, which the R&I community has. So I agree, we need to reach out. We need to reach out to the research and innovation community. We need to reach out to the policy people. And we need to reach out, first and foremost, to politicians in the European Commission who can make all this happen. Okay.
Thank you very much to uh, Robert, Ingeborg, and Stephanie. It's a very rich uh, contribution. Uh, now we will have uh, uh, the final session uh, uh, in the plenary, so <laughs> theoretically, uh, in a virtual plenary uh, on governance perspective for responsive open science uh, starting at 11.45. So we should move there uh, to the other to the room. Thank you very much for uh, the, the speakers and thank you.